Program Director, Registrar, Dr. Pinkim Khojana, Dr. Butroski, the Chancellor of Central University of Technology in absentia, Dr. Sylvan Siani, the Chairperson of Council who is present this morning, and members of Council who were mentioned earlier by the Registrar, the members of the CUT Executive and Senior Management present this morning, the members of the academic uh, staff, you see so many of them seated here in front of you. We really appreciate that. Members of support staff services who are in attendance. As the registrar said, the only person called president in a university campus at both Bloemfontein and Valcom campuses is the president of the SRC in uh, Bloemfontein, Mr. Akona Komeni, who gave what I believe is a moving speech earlier on. Mr. Neo Kala, president of the SRC at the Welcome Campus. Members of the SRC, as they have been introduced, students, they may also be parents and guardians. They may also be sponsors and donors of our students. They may be strategic partners of our university. Distinguished guests from the business community, from the provincial and local government. Ladies and gentlemen, before I start, I need to just make a few observations that I never anticipated I would, I would make in this hall. There is something very important about a university that values the participation of its student body in everything that it does. What was demonstrated this morning was just precisely that about CUT. We saw earlier students displaying their culture-based dances. We saw earlier the collaboration between the Bloemfontein Campus Choir and the band, which I believe also uh, entertains and presents gospel music at the, uni the university campus uh, church. That is very wonderful to see it happen. And I should really thank those who organized all these student groupings to present the items they presented that I hope that from this year we shall not have these boring functions at CUT where we sit and by virtue of the powers vested in me we start something and then Mtembo speaks and then not a, an exciting speech even we need a lot of excitement, we need a lot of engagement with our students because they are part and parcel of the life of this university. So thank you very much to everybody who made this possible, including the students themselves. I think they need a round of applause. <laughs> the SRC president, as I said earlier, gave a very important speech, I believe, and most important is the issue of the second decade of CUT's existence. And in so many ways in his words, in his speech, the second decade of our existence as a university cannot be seen as synonymous with the 1980s, the decade of my being a student at the University of Fort Hare at that time, and everything that we did so many years ago, these cannot be seen as the same. 
It therefore behoves of all young people to chart a new chapter for themselves that's contingent on the challenges of the 21st century, not the challenges of the 1980s. We see so many people who are sort of stuck in a time warp, thinking that they live in the 1980s, where if you are a member of the SRC and you are seen in a meeting sharing a cup of tea with management, you would be a sellout. The government of the day emphasizes so much the idea of working together to make progress in this country. It should not be about grandstanding of the student body or the student leadership against management or management against the students. Because if we were to do that, eventually our people will be the most negatively affected because there won't be progress. Therefore, we have to chart a new path in our second decade, and in the 21st century for that matter, because the 1980s were not part of this century we are in. So thank you very much, Mr. President, for your speech. I also particularly should acknowledge a young person who openly acknowledges people that have made him who he is today. I think young people, as soon as they become teenagers, think they know it all. I went through that myself. And whether it's your parents, it's your guardians, it's your teacher, it's your lecturer, you just think they are boring and there is nothing of any use that they could ever tell you. So, Dr. Fredericks, thank you very much for having raised a student, having nurtured a student like the president. I'm not sucking up to the president, but I'm just speaking the truth. Back to my speech, on behalf of the Chancellor and the Chairperson of Council, I welcome all new and returning students and their parents and guardians, some of whom may be accompanying them. We are really thrilled that you will be joining our Central University of Technology Free State family. I can assure you that you could never have made a better decision in choosing to study at CUT. Well, we happen right now to be in Bloemfontein, the city of Mangawong. It provides a very stable and calm environment. And beyond the city of Mangawung provided that environment, the location of CUT in particular at the Bloemfontein campus does that even more spectacularly. And trust me, this is the ninth year I have been at CUT, so I know what I'm talking about. To the west, which is by the main gate there, there is the Park Road Police Station. Should anything untoward happen to the student, any student here at the university, even if it may have been caused by students themselves, we do not even have to call the police. They just we just shout out loud across the street and they just walk in and solve whatever problem. To the east of the campus, there are two churches, the Catholic and the Anglican cathedrals, that provide almost on-site spiritual and moral care to all of us, even if we may not be inside the walls of these cathedrals. Whilst you are in your class or you are writing an examination or you are in your office, you can easily overhear 
church bells and prayers from there, and unless you are made of stone, you will really feel the Holy Spirit engulfing you. And it might just help you pass your exam, exam, or it might just help you produce an innovation in the laboratory. So, once we have strayed away from our godly ways from the churches, if we are not doing godly ways, we will be straying away from what the churches represent to the east of us. And if we stray away from the godly ways and we have discipline from the police to the west, that gets exercised from time to time. To the north of us, just here, are courts. Again, we just walk into them when there are issues that require pronouncement of guilt or innocence. Like good neighbors with the courts, we do not have even to make an appointment to go there. Now, especially to our new students, there are also those people who do not study on time. They bash their evenings away and thereafter, they try to cram a whole year's work in a few days, just before the examinations. Sometimes some screws come loose in their heads when they do that. Don't worry. To the south of the campus, there is a psychiatric hospital that deals with such <laughs> cases. So whichever way you go, you are well protected at the Bloemfontein campus. This address I'm going to give emanates from lots of institutional engagement. So it's therefore not mine alone. It's designed to do a number of things. The first thing is about welcoming all of our students, parents, guardians, staff, partners, and stakeholders and in this regalia we have on, as we sit on the stage, demonstrate where our students should aim for or aim at. I remember as a first year student at Forte University in the early 80s, some people that I didn't know as a first year student who lived in the same residence as I did, I would look at them and think, ah, I'm much smarter than this one. And I will finish my degree long before he or she, uh, he does. Lo and behold, I went to the graduation ceremony in April or May. There, that particular individual was graduating with an honors degree. So, this opportunity of firstly welcoming all of the first year students and making them see the expected ultimate outcome of their being here is very important. In fact, if we could, we would make sure that all those who continue to be our students who have graduated are also part of us here as part of an inclusive spirit to everything we do as staff together with our, our students, so that you do not do what I did in 1982 when I looked down upon somebody who had achieved already much, much more than I had. The second reason for this address is that in a university setting, an address should, by necessity, provide knowledge, information, and facts. As a result, this address provides not just cliches and hollow factless marketing of CUT, but facts and information about CUT. The third reason is that the address is about CUT's accountability to you as a university community, our stakeholders, and the broader society that looks up to us for solutions and innovations in socioeconomic growth and development, particularly 
of this central region. The central region consists obviously of the free state, mainly, but we also have the Northern Cape that as a university we support in its educational ideals at high education level. We've got parts of the Northwest, we've got parts of Gauteng even. We even have Lesotho as an independent country that we support in its educational ideals. That's the central region. The fourth and the last reason for this address is that it gives hope, I hope it does, to those who wish to build and support this university on its journey to the future as a technological university of the 21st century. So in these four respects, I will talk to phenomenal changes and achievements that have transformed and are still transforming this university and the central region of South Africa. In the nine years that I have been here as Vice Chancellor and Principal, CUT has shown, through its efforts and achievements, a strong sense of innovation, a dogged determination to succeed and be excellent, a huge capacity for hard work, and boldness to adapt and transform itself almost beyond recognition. Anybody who may have been here in 2005, 2006, 2007 will find this university, whether you are at the Valcom campus or the Bloemfontein campus, having changed radically and perhaps beyond recognition for those people. Today, we are well poised to make use of our considerable strengths and chart exciting new paths into the future. The accomplishments and examples of excellence that I'll be sharing with you today are without question the result of many people working diligently and efficiently together. Hence, I say this address is theirs too. They include our staff, our students, our alumni, our administrators, our managers, our sponsors, and donors, our partners from business and industry, government, and other stakeholders whose contribution cannot go unnoticed. At COT, we have, over the years, developed a strategic implementation framework we call the four Ps. This framework consists of, in no order of priority, plans, people, products, and pennies. I know you are second English language speakers like myself. Pennies just means money, nothing else. Every strategy we put in place to realize our vision has to address, where practically possible, each of these four Ps. In 2010, we adopted a new vision, Vision 2020 we called it, which has its associated plans from academic and research plans to physical planning and many other areas. Every year I reiterate our vision statement for the benefit of those who are new to the university, staff and students, and those who might be familiar with it since 2010 but maybe may have forgotten it. It simply states, by 2020, Central University of Technology shall be an engaged university that focuses on producing social and technological innovations for socioeconomic development, primarily in the central region of South Africa. I have to say a few things about this vision because words without explaining some of the phrases in this statement may not be enough. There are three phases that define, three things that I think any student of management should know when you set a vision. It's objective, it's comparative advantage, it's scope. 
That's what this vision has, this vision statement. It's got these three things. is socio-economic development, more especially regional development. That's our objective. The objective is not to become the top university in the world for what? It's not about ourselves as a small institution in the broader context of the region, in the broader context of many institutions, a contribution to the development of this region. So our vision is about this region, not about us. That's the objective. Our comparative advantage, because if you go out there in the world, you need to be thinking about what's unique about ourselves that could allow us to make that unique contribution to our region, to our nation, and of course, then to the rest of the world. We are a university of technology, and as a result, we therefore have to produce social and technological innovations. Thirdly, our scope. Our scope is very deliberate. It's the central region of South Africa. We are not saying we want to be the best ever in the world. Well, we may well be the best ever in the world. But if the people of the central region are, going, are not going to feel our existence, are not going to see the outcomes of our innovations and research, the outcomes of our academic programs, then we are not worth the membership of this central region. So, of course, once we can show this region, once we can show this nation, this country, that we can make things work right here in the region. Now, if you can remember what I've just said about our vision, I'm pretty sure that in everything you do, in the decisions that you make, you will keep the scope the central region, you will keep in mind our comparative advantage about producing social and technological innovations. You will keep the objective in mind, the objective being socio-economic development in this region, not existence for its own sake. Universities globally are faced with a series of common challenges. These include responding to increasing societal expectations and increasing demands on them, more complex ways of impacting and disseminating curricula and knowledge, a need to diversify our revenue streams, improving and demonstrating quality whilst we increase our enrollments and class sizes, dwindling financial support to universities and its students, how to exploit and embed technologies, how we should confront globalization. There are many other challenges I have not mentioned. In the wake of these challenges, we can no longer shoot first and thereafter call whatever we should or hit, call it our target. Our plans, our priorities, should be consistent with what our region, our nation, and the world expect and demand of us. Unlike universities of old, universities in the 21st century no longer have carte blanche hegemony and legitimacy. Society expects them to earn these hegemony and legitimacy, relevance, based on tangible contributions they make to the development of their societies. We are driven by ambitious goals we have set for the university, which are contained in our Vision 2020 and its associated plans, like the academic plan, our transformation vision, and many other important documents of the university. Our infrastructure, is expanding in order to meet the needs of our region and the country. The university master plan approved by council in June 2014 seeks to establish a long-term estates framework 
and a medium-term development plan that supports the academic and growth aspirations of this university. Construction of new buildings has been underway almost uninterrupted since the first phase of construction that started in 2007-2008 and the second phase that ended in 2013. So up until the end of 2015, we'll have had seven to eight years of development at this university almost uninterrupted in terms of the new buildings, not only here at the Bloemfontein campus, but at the Valcom campus. Currently, because we are an organic and versatile university, we are in the process of reviewing our strategic goals that were approved by Council in 2010. We will realign them with our vision, and we'll also realign them with the new developments in higher education and in the whole world. In this regard, an updated strategic plan will be submitted to the Department of Higher Education and Training by the end of this year. This will provide a revised or a refined roadmap for attaining our goals and accelerating CUT's development. The newly introduced reporting regulations of the Department of Higher Education and Training will help to keep us on track with our planning and reporting systems. In November 2014, the Council of the University, which is the governance body of the university, approved a revised planning cycle that aligns with the new DHET reporting cycle. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, CUT continues to make a remarkable contribution to the intellectual, professional, and the skills development of its staff, students, its alumni, and the citizenry of the broader central region. These are all our people, and we have to continue to serve them diligently. Over the past decade, since we became a university of technology, the profile and pedigree of the university's academic and research staff have improved, and we are committed to making our institution an even more inclusive community. The number of academic and research staff that have doctorates now stands at about 30% of the total number of staff, permanent staff, as against a number of our counterpart universities of technology where this number stands at about 15%. For the period October 2005 to September 2012, the percentage of employees from designated groups, that means black people, as we say in this country, Indian and colored people, their percentage has increased from 76% to 82%, whilst the percentage of female employees remained unchanged at 49%. We may have to do more there because even as, if you look at the enrollment of our students, we have more female students now enrolled at universities than male students. Therefore, that should also show we must get more and more academics who are females So these figures demonstrate the university's commitment to attaining a staff profile that reflects the country's racial and demographics, uh, gender demographics. At CUT, we recognize that attracting and at retaining expert staff require a well-structured and a functional human resources section. In 2014, we implemented a new HR turnaround strategy to ensure effective and efficient human resources management. This has led to the appointment of a new senior team, including a new director, HR, with a wide experience in business and industry. With the leadership of this team, we are well poised, I hope, to make considerable improvements to our human resources management, and we are well on our way to attracting high-performing individuals to join our excellent broader team 
There is also a team at this university that we call the A-team, which is not appointed or elected by anybody, but it's self-elected. It's only based on what we call here at CUT the crazy ideas they could put before the university community for implementation. That team has continued to impress with its innovative, crazy ideas. In 2014, 13, 14, they imagined Leonard Tuto, a red-blooded CUT alumnus at the Park Road Gate. I'm told that if any student ever enters the Park Road Gate without kissing Leonard Tuto's foot, their chances of success at CUT will be greatly limited. So when you see that red statue and you just pass it by, you may be passing by your success. So if you haven't done that, you are a first year student, I think after this you could do it. The latest initiative of this team has been the establishment of our academic commons, the area in front of the library, which is still in, under construction as you will see. The space in front of the library will be endowed with trees and seating areas ideal for contemplation, intellectual and social engagement for our students and staff over a cup of drink, tea or coffee that will be sold at a kiosk that I understand will be built there. To make life better livable for our staff, we have a remuneration policy that puts our salary scales at the 50th percentile of the broader market. For many years, our scales have been behind the market. Further, there has been what we call here salary anomalies as a result of historical and discriminatory practices that you find anywhere in an organization in this country. Such anomalies or disparities in salary can be found anywhere, as I'm saying. Bold and trailblazing as CUT always is, it has just confronted this and made the necessary salary scale and actual salary adjustments without begging government for additional money like state-owned enterprises like ASCOM, SAA, SABC. They are always begging, going to government, going to us as the taxpayers, asking for many billions and many billions. We did this without going to government to ask for money without going to a bank for an overdraft. Despite what those who peddle lies and push sinister agendas in the media might say, we are proud that as of 1 July 2014, our council make it, made it possible for us to achieve the following results in the area of salaries. 282 of our permanent and long-term contract staff complement of 753 employees, which constitutes 37.4% of our employees, had their salaries adjusted upwards. 236 of our black staff complement of 465, constituting 50.8% of our total black staff employees, had their salaries adjusted upwards. 148 of our female staff complement of 372, which constitutes 39.8% of our total female employees at CUT, had their salaries adjusted upwards. Now, with these hard facts, I have absolutely no idea who the so-called trio in the New Age newspaper article that was entitled Trio in Big Salary Scandal it came about a week ago. Clearly, even though you heard I'm a mathematician, maybe I've lost something for having been a manager for so many years. Clearly, the definition of tri trio, which when I was a mathematics student, I knew that to mean three, must now be 281 of our staff, as I said, who got their salaries adjusted upwards, must now be 236 of our black staff, who got their salaries adjusted uh, upwards, must now be 148 of our female staff who got their salaries adjusted upwards. 
That's the new trio. That's the new mathematics. Challenges, I must admit, still remain in this very same area of anomalies and disparities. We couldn't eradicate these in the first round simply because of the complexity of the problem and the limits of our affordability. In fact, if we were like ESCOM or SAA and so on, we could have gone to government and said we need three times more than we spent in these salary adjustments. But because we have unions who understand our limits of affordability, we could come to an agreement that we will gradually make these adjustments over a few years until we are all satisfied that we've done the best we could, we could do. So this year, we will be continuing to grapple with this problem of salary disparities. New phases will come. In the last decade, CUT's enrollment increased by almost 36% from 10,320 students in 2005 to 14,334 students in 2014. In 2014, a total of 6,295, which is about 43.9%, of our students enrolled in our priority area of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. There is a secret there. Not many of our competitor universities can boast such a high percentage of enrollment in this critical area of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. If you want, you can go to any neighbor and check what their percentage is. We wouldn't like to leave them behind. Of course, except those that spend all their time not in class but uh, uh, in bashes. One of the major shocks and stresses of life in this country is our stagnant economic growth, which begets unemployment and misery for many, especially our young people. According to the 2014 World Economic Forum Global Risk Report, more than 50% of young South Africans between the ages of 15 and 24 are unemployed. More than 50% of young South Africans between the ages of 15 and 24 are unemployed. South Africa has the third highest unemployment rate in the world for this category of our youth. I think we have bigger battles to fight in this country. The battles are not between students and management. The battles are not between staff and management, between unions and management. The battle in this country for young people of this country more than 50% of whom are unemployed. The battle is economic development. And the battle is not economic freedom being dealt with, as one professor said recently. Economic freedom in this country country should not be dealt with like a firefighter does with fire. So those who want to fight economic freedom should not extinguish it through whatever policies they may put on the table. They must fan it. A firefighter extinguishes the fire. Freedom fighters or economic fighters must fight for and not against our economic freedom. We can talk more about that at a later stage. That is the challenge in this country. And young people, you have nobody else to help you in this battle for economic growth. 
in this battle to ensure that there are more jobs, that there is less unemployment in this country. You only have yourselves. We who started at university and all, were almost guaranteed jobs when we finished, which is something you are not guaranteed anymore. We've had our time. We've messed up the economy of this country. A number of us have been corrupt, and you see them every day milking the resources of this university for their own personal gain. They come to us, they call themselves politicians and every other name you can think of. The country remains unworkable economically. So it's up to you as the young people to fight bigger battles out there about economic development in this country or to come to CUT and fight with management on NSFAS loans that actually are not enough because the economy is not growing rapidly enough. Or some of our people who have resorted to xenophobia and are fighting those people they call foreigners who are actually part and parcel of this continent. That's all playing small games. The bigger game is how, what are we going to do and how shall we do it to develop and grow the economy of this region, of this country. There has to be a new radical approach for a university to how we educate and train our students. So I'm going to be self-critical now. I said you have to do something, but we, having enrolled you here at the university, also have a challenge. We have to do something radical. Since time immemorial, universities have trained and educated their students for employment. But now, there is no adequate supply of employment. Thus, the biggest 21st century question and challenge for universities should be how to train and educate our students to create employment. To create employment. You as university students are a very small percentage of young people between the ages of 15 and 24. You hover at around maybe 17, 18% now of young people of this country, about 4.5 to 5 million young people of this country. You are the cream of the crop. You are getting exposed to the best knowledge and information that exists in the world. Why should you stand in the queues with many other students who have never seen Leonard Tuto? You are the ones who have the responsibility to create jobs for those who only have metric, for those who have even less than metric. You can't be in the queues with them. You must go to those queues to pick and choose the ones that you want to employ. But as I've said, we also have a responsibility as a university that whilst you are within the, the precincts of our university, we do the best we can to train and educate you to create employment. Wikipedia defines future-proofing as the process of anticipating future events and developing methods, skills, and competencies that will enable us to minimize the effects of shocks and stresses arising from these events. <clears throat> One way we think our students could future-proof themselves against the effects of almost non-existent economic growth is by being innovative and entrepreneurial. 
CUT seeks to transform its entrepreneurship education in line with the university's vision of becoming a robust agent of innovation and socioeconomic development in the central region as a whole. When I talk entrepreneurship, I'm not talking about young people who are being educated here who look forward to getting tenders from government in a few years, who look forward to getting tenders even from the university itself. I'm talking about young people who will think big about what this region requires, who will not be trying to milk the little resources that the people of, of our country have through those tenders, but will think about how to enlarge the coffers and the tax base of this country. We can no longer be content with simply producing graduates into a hostile, jobless, and poverty-stricken socioeconomic environment. We have to change course and provide a form of future-proofing that will shape not only individual futures, but the future of our region and that of our country. It is in this spirit of future-proofing through innovation and entrepreneurship that I took my sabbatical leave last year in order to gather knowledge on how we can reposition ourselves to be better aligned as a 21st century university confronting 21st century challenges of lackluster economic growth that invariably results in youth unemployment, inequitable livelihoods, and in poverty. In today's world of global connectedness, graduates must be able to work and network globally, to work creatively in teams of varied cultures, and foster informed citizenry anywhere in the world. As a result, internationalization at CUT is both an academic ex exercise and a behavioral mindset. On the one hand, it is intended to strengthen and add value to our academic programs. On the other hand, it is there to ensure that we have a diverse student body, as you saw earlier this morning, that will enhance the learning experience of all our students. So our objective in this area of internationalization is to increase our proportion of international students from the current 3.6% to 10% by 2020, with the majority of these students being drawn from the rest of the African continent. Thus, when you see people in the townships looting businesses of people that they call foreigners, you must always remember that we have an internationalization strategy. No university in the world is worth its salt without drawing some of its staff and students from other parts of the world. It only becomes just a high school. So you must defend those people with everything you have. Actually, if you think about ourselves as people of this country, if you think far back, we came from somewhere else. If you think about me and you, many years ago our families were not even here in Bloemfontein. They were elsewhere, so we could also be called foreigners. So as university students, we must fight hard against xenophobia in this country. That's taking root. As I've said, part of the reason for this xenophobia is that people see so-called foreigners as usurping their livelihoods. But that's not really true. In any community, and I know it in my community, where there is a little bit of progress, it's only because some people coming from outside have come into that community. In my village somewhere in this country, before there was electricity, men never used to support any introduction of electricity because it would kill their cattle. So that's how local people who are used to poverty and all sorts of things, that's how, that's how they begin to think because they would not have been exposed to many other things. But once somebody from somewhere who had been exposed to electricity comes into a village 
and says, but how do you live here without electricity? It's only then that you begin to see development in a country. So let's take people from elsewhere in a similar way. They have experiences and things that they have seen. In fact, those spaza shop owners who are failing to run their businesses and want to blame foreigners, they must think hard about what the foreigners are doing to make their businesses successful, rather than saying, well, you are taking an opportunity from us. Where were they? They've been here for ages. And those foreigners may have just come a few years ago. Let's learn from them. They have come with new strategies, and I know that some people want to suggest that there are other means that are nefarious that they use to obtain their goods and so forth. I don't know. But let's not use those things. Let's learn. Let's work together. Let's make this country better. Our products at CUT are not graduates. Students and graduates are not really customers either. Students and graduates are themselves part of the people I talked about earlier that we are supporting in many ways. Students and graduates co-produce our research and innovations, and they help us to reimagine and shape our curricula. Our collective products, therefore, are our academic programs and qualifications, our research and innovations and the goods and services that arise out of these and arise out of our engagement with our broader society. So in respect of our products, what we've done recently has been to introduce or actually reimagine nine new programs that are demand-driven and user-oriented. Four of these new programs were implemented at CUT in 2014. These are the Advanced Diploma in Logistics and Transport Management, the Bachelor of Sciences in Hydrology and Water Management, the Higher Certificate in Community Development Work. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm mixing things. The ones that I have just talked to are the ones that have been introduced as of the beginning of 2015. Logistics and Transport Management, BSc, Hydrology and Water Management, Higher Certificate in Community Development, uh, Development Work, the Bachelor of Education. But we introduced some already in 2014. A total of 149 students were enrolled in our newly implemented programs of 2014, which include a higher certificate in renewable energy technologies, a diploma in studio art, an advanced diploma in agricultural extension, a bachelor in radiography. Those were introduced in 2014. And the success rates have been very impressive. At 73, 75, 83, 85 percent for all of these uh, four, respectively, that I mentioned. Although research was not part of our priorities as the then Technicons before 2004, universities of technology are increasing their profile in South Africa in the area of research and innovation. We have seen improvements in our research outputs over the years from 78 units in 2007 to 128.5 units in 2013. However, our research outputs are not commensurate with what a university is expected to produce. Neither are they commensurate with the number of academic staff with doctorates, which is about 30% uh, of our staff, as I talked to earlier. In this regard, more work is still needed to scale up our research activities for our university to remain competitive. Establishing a research culture is a complex and a costly exercise in terms of time and resources, which cannot be tackled from one perspective only, but it needs a multi-dimensional strategy 
through all the stages of the life of a researcher, from postgraduate student to a well-established researcher. CUT continues to invest in research development as one of its strategic priorities and has invested a lot of money in this and will continue to do so in 2015 and beyond. Our research infrastructure has improved quite a lot. For example, CUT received funding from the National Research Foundation's Research Infrastructure Support Program for a new state-of-the-art 3D printing machine to the value of about 2 million rand. In addition to the NRF um, infrastructure support, the NRF recently approved the awarding of a research chair in additive manufacturing specializing in medical applications. There is a lot that is happening in this area. I'm particularly pleased that CUT is taking a lead in innovations that will change the face of medical science in South Africa. With regard to teaching and learning, excellence in teaching and research, we recognize this annually. The prizes are awarded to academics displaying best practices in research, innovation, teaching and learning, curriculum development, and in engagement. Excellent learning is also rewarded at CUT, and students who achieve distinctions in their studies are awarded bursaries from, for example, in 2014, our 15 million rand council approved fund that was set aside for just scholarships and bursaries. In this way, we hope to motivate all students to strive for excellence. We continue to contribute to the improvement of the quality of education in our schools around us as part of our engagement and socioeconomic development of the region. The school's advancement academy con continues to support the schooling sector in the Free State and enjoys the sound cooperation of the Free State Department of Education. We also have Saturday classes that have been very successful. We also have a new, relatively new education mentorship development program. In all of these interventions and engagements, we have had generous contributions for our funding that we need to acknowledge. For the Educator Mentorship Development Program, the Telcom Foundation has committed about 5 million rand for the years 2014 to 2015. The Standard Bank has funded our winter school in 2014. The Saturday classes are supported by Mutual and Federal, by the Council for the Built Environment, and many other contributors like interstate bus lines that transport some of the students from as far away as Tsabelo. Uh, 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 During 2014, Mayor Sita started joining this groundbreaking endeavor of supporting our young people in high schools and has committed funding of at least half a million rand for 2015. Amongst other things, creating a vibrant student life on our campuses, as you saw this morning, earlier this morning, is very important to us. On the 19th of January this year, our own brand new community radio station, CUT 05.8, which is my early morning half past four station that I listen to as I drive to the gym. Most pleasing about CUT FM is that the students who work there, from the production to the marketing team, form part of our work integrated learning program that prepares our students to graduate from the university with much needed experience in their chosen fields. Work integrated learning is one of the vital programs that help us to produce world-class graduates in many fields. So this is an opportunity that will lead these students into successful careers in media-related fields like broadcasting, sound engineering, marketing, and others. CUT has proven to be a force to be reckoned with as the achievements of our students attest. For example, our Enactus CU team participated in the Enactus national competition from 10 to 11 July 2014. 
In the Harmony Local Economic Development Special Competitions, this team trumped all 26 participating institutions and came home with the first prize trophy and the winning check. Our president is actually part of this team at Bloemfontein campus. <clears throat> CUT sport. There is something special about sport in the Free State. And it's not different here at CUT. Our sport has proven to be a force to be reckoned with too. The CUT Ishias rugby team won the 2014 Varsity Shield Championship. As a result, the team was promoted to play in the FNB Varsity Cup competition, which is the senior team for universities. Just this coming Monday, the first match, rugby match, as part of the FNB Varsity Cup competition, will take place in our rugby stadium against UJ. I think we must send those Gauteng sissies back home. I'm sorry to use the, the term. You understand what it means. The CUT soccer team also continues to perform well in the Vodacom League, as the team currently holds the sixth position on the log of 18 teams, perhaps better than Manchester United in its league. CUT Cricket's second team won the first division tournament and was promoted to the Free State Super League for the 2014-2015 season. The CUT Dance Club obtained top three positions in the Gauteng Dance Competition, all the way in Gauteng. And the CUT Choir obtained an overall second position in the silver category of the Old Mutual Provincial Competition. These are incredible sporting and extramural activities and achievements therein that we must appreciate as a university. Ladies and gentlemen, as a higher education institution, it makes sense for us to channel our financial resources, our pennies, towards our core function. You've never heard CUT, unlike some of the universities, that have gone back into government asking for 800 million rands and many other state-owned enterprises that I mentioned earlier, needing much from government than what it deserves. So we really do take care of our pennies here. For example, regarding the expenditure on salaries, our expenditure ratio, which was once 51 to 49 in favor of support staff, has stabilized at 60-40 in favor of academic staff. In support of students, as I stated earlier, we set aside, for example, in 2015, we have set aside 16.5 million rand for scholarships and bursaries. We have many programs that support staff development. I'm not going to mention them. We also take care of our infrastructure of our buildings, of our grounds. And we invest a lot in that. About 5.3% of our budget goes into just that. But money alone doesn't keep buildings and grounds immaculate. It's the people there. Some of the people that you might think they are lowly because they, are, they work in the gardens, they are cleaners, are the ones who actually make this university very attractive. There is a study that was done a few years ago at many universities in this country on infrastructure, the status of infrastructure. Universities that I'm not going to mention had appalling infrastructure. Universities that are even in cities, I'm not going to mention, had appalling infrastructure. Not because government did not allocate money to them, just because they misused the money that was allocated to them. Just because there are staff who clean, who tend to the gardens, are not good enough to come with innovations about how to clean better, how to maintain the gardens better. We have those staff members here at CUT, and we are proud that we have them. We continue to embark on 
an, an ambitious infrastructure development program in order to cater for our growing staff and student needs. As I said earlier, we've grown substantially over the past few years with major new world-class teaching and research facilities, courtesy of the Department of Higher Education and Training, and of course our council. In addition to the new construction, various facilities, for example here at the Bloemfontein campus, were renovated for improved teaching and learning to the value of 25 million rand in 2014. A further 26 million rand has been set aside for similar capital expenditure for 2015. The Valcom campus's bulk infrastructure will see an investment as part of some of the buildings that are being constructed there to the value of 49 million rand by the end of 2015. So if one looks back at 2007, 2008, Almost 600 million rand has been invested in infrastructure and buildings at the broader Central University of Technology in both Valcom and Bloemfontein. In fact, the last phase that we are currently engaged in right now is a 320 million rand phase of infrastructure development, which is part of, again, the government's infrastructure development uh, and supplementary funds that are provided by our council. This will allow us, for example, to construct new residences at this university to the tune of about 131 million rand and about 188 million rand towards academic infrastructure. Construction of the new infrastructure buildings is underway on both campuses and should be completed by December of 2015. In addition to that, the new residences that are going to be built by the end of this year, we are talking to developers to see if there couldn't be a private, public-private partnership with them that will further increase the number of beds available to our students, so that as they study, they have an environment that is more conducive to studying rather than where they might be, uh, out there where there are all sorts of sharks that claim to provide accommodation. We are proud to announce that the year 2014 was another good year for CUT, as we received yet another unqualified audit. I'm mentioning this because in this country, and especially in our government at municipal and many other levels, we hardly ever hear of unqualified audit reports. I must tell you a secret, though, about something being unqualified. You see, in a university, we work with people who qualify to be admitted, who qualify to graduate. So it may look like there's something odd if I'm saying we have an unqualified report because we work with things that are qualified, but that's how it works in finance. So what a qualified audit report means is that we have met the requirements of the international financial reporting standards. We have used our money for the purposes that it was used. It was meant to be used. Since 2007 8 when the new infrastructure started, there is not a single building that stood halfway because money had been lost, which is what you see in many other places, which, by the way, is what you young people have to go out there and fight. The next few years will be about accelerating our contributions towards socioeconomic development in more tangible ways. We must translate our successes in our classrooms and in our laboratories and engage our partners and the broader society in a mutually beneficial manner. If we are up to the challenge, <clears throat> the best is yet to come at CUT for those we serve, especially this region. 
Allow me to comment on some matters that require our attention. I would like to quote the Red Queen's advice to Alice in a novel by Lewis Carroll entitled Through the Looking Glass. I quote, if it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place, then if you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. That observation applies to where we have been and where we are going as CUT. Running twice as fast as we can is going to be hard work. And you might fairly ask, why should we do so? You have just told us, Professor, of many achievements that we have made over the last few years. What more should we do? There are many answers, most of which are embedded in the opportunities we have created, but only partially realized. With our achievements, we have generated higher expectations, and therefore we cannot rest our laurels. What was great yesterday, through the efforts of others, becomes just good into the future. So we need to continue to pursue greatness because that's the pursuit of many of our competitors. I believe there are key parts of CUT's vision that continue to be vital to our success and in regional development. That should be our ultimate outcome. We must keep very strong and our focus must also be very strong on these outcomes. They include our singular and powerful emphasis on the quality of our program offerings, community engagement for mutually de beneficial development, attracting potentially successful students and supporting them to become not just employable graduates, but innovators and entrepreneurs of note that will help to create employment. We must continue to attract and retain expert staff and support their development and well-being. We must leapfrog forward through strategic partnerships with top institutions locally and abroad. However, even as we continue to build on these, it is also true that we must make strategic adjustments to give a fresh and organic impetus to our development. This is needed because our external environment is changing profoundly and competition is even more intense. In particular, our good progress must not make us complacent, but must propel us to new peaks of greatness and excellence. In closing, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the many departments and units to students and staff, to everything that they do that helps to advance innovative curricula and teaching methods, to advance a vibrant research and innovation program that will challenge and inspire this cohort of students we are welcoming. With the leadership, commitment, and efforts of our council, staff, students, alumni, benefactors, partners, and friends, we are indeed well poised to push forward and make CUT a catalyst for city and regional development of the central region of South Africa. Thank you.